and we will get All right. Well, it is my um, pleasure to introduce Teresa Brown. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about her and a little bit about her presentation. I guess I should inform you, I'm Jessica Howard and I'm gonna be your host tonight. And Teresa holds a BA in liberal arts with an emphasis in elementary education and a master's degree in curriculum and instruction. She also holds endorsements in K-12 English language arts and gifted education. With three years of teaching under her belt, she embarked on a journey towards advocacy for gifted learners, first as a classroom teacher in a multi-age third and fourth grade classroom, and then in a variety of roles leading to her current area of service as Dean of Student Support at Academy for Advanced and Creative Learning. She's in an association, she is an Association of American Educators Foundation Advocacy Fellow and is currently the president-elect for the Pikes Peak Association for Gifted Students in Colorado Springs. And I also get to work with her when we're on our committee and she is fantastic. Um, the title of her presentation today is Connections as a Roadmap Through Literature. So I am very excited to introduce Teresa Brown and enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Um, let's see if I can share my screen. All right. It's thinking about it. Um, so my name is Teresa Brown and I am our Dean of Student Support here at Academy ACL here in Colorado Springs. And um, I, we've been open for 12 years and I have been lucky enough to be here for all 12. Um, and I started off as a division three teacher teaching third and fourth grade. Um, and I taught um, a high level uh, language arts class to second, third and fourth graders, a third grade math class. And then we had a multi-age inquiry um, class during the course of the school day. So it was wonderful. Um, and I enjoyed every single minute of it. One of the things that I noticed though, is that in order for our kids to make sense of the world around them, they needed to see connections between things. Um, let's see, I'm not sure if you can see my screen or not, we'll have to see. Not yet, it still says loading. We might want to stop it and start that share screen again, I think. Uh, there we go. Wonderful. All right, let's try again. Oh, come on. Technology is fantastic. We could say that. <laughs> Sometimes annoying. <laughs> let's see. All right. Let's try one more time. You know how things work really well when you don't, doesn't matter if they work? That's kind of where we are tonight. Okay, so, um, one of my passions has always been literature. Um, and I like to think of literature as a way to escape. Um, and I'm the kind of person who needs a map to get where it is that I'm going. Um, there's say a little uh, empanada place in Denver on Broadway. And you can hand me a map like the one in the picture or you know, Siri can tell me how to get there but I will never remember how to get there until I can connect with certain things on the way. My friend Gina's house is the first, that's how I know I'm entering Denver. And I know that I don't have to go all the way downtown. The exit I want is before downtown. I can see what's on the corner. I know that I have to pass um, a 7-Eleven before um, I look for this little brown building that looks like the Chinook bookshop. Um, and then I have to find somewhere to park before I can partake of all of the goodness that is contained within Maria Empanadas. Um, 
So for our kids, they need a roadmap as well. And so when we think about literature, um, I was the kid who got all the books from the library and I took home big stacks of books and um, I read them over and over and over again. And I connected with the characters and the places. These are places I'll never get to go probably, but I enjoyed every single moment of it because I was able to connect as a human being to a character in a book. Um, I like to say the literature tells the story of our human experience. Um, I find now as an adult that I Google information as I'm reading. Um, I wanna know more about this thing that a particular character said, or um, I've been watching murder mysteries. And so I wanna know a little bit more about that particular case. Um, but I, I get to connect personally um, and I can make generalizations and use big ideas to connect with the text. Um, several years ago, our building did a um, school-wide staff um, book study and we used Focus by Mike Schmoker. And one of the things that stuck with me while we were um, going through this book study, he talked about a lot of different things that teachers could do to improve student learning. And a lot of it led to simplicity. But one of the things that stuck with me was this idea of creating purpose and interest in anything that we taught. Um, so for instance, when we taught the Middle Ages, I needed to give them a reason they needed to know it and then create interest. And, um, Turns out that eight and nine-year-old boys are very interested in weaponry. Um, so we did a lot of discussion about the evolution of weaponry and why and how the castles were built and what that looks like today. And you know, what did we learn from all of that, um, that architecture? Um, but from a reading perspective, we needed the same thing. Kids need to know what their purpose for reading is and how they can connect to it. Um, as a writing teacher, I always taught the kids that you need to know who your audience is and it's not always me the teacher. Um, it's very rarely me the teacher. You have to decide who is your audience. Is it other kids your age? Is it younger students? Is it you know people who like animals, people who wanna know more about a particular animal? Um, and then what's your purpose for writing? Do you wanna entertain them? Do you want them to learn something? Um, the same thing for reading. You have to think about what did the author intend for me to get from this? So when we think about big ideas and generalizations, um, these are several that um, we use as a school to help tie everything together. Um, we use the integrated curriculum model by Joyce Van Tassel Baska and um, it integrates the big idea, advanced content, and then choice and process and product. As a teacher, one of the neat things to be able to do is to start a unit or um, a particular area of study and say, you know what, everything we're going to learn right now has to do with power. And let's talk about what it means to have power. How do you get power? Um, can power be transferred from one place to another, from one person to another? And we talk about all of the generalizations, which are things that are true um, about that particular big idea that would apply in any situation. And you start with that big idea. And as you're reading a novel or as you're reading poetry, you're going through and you're thinking about how does how is what we read tie back to this big idea? Um, one of the units that I taught that I just absolutely loved was all about um, patterns of change. And it was, it was easy to tie that big idea of change and patterns to each novel. And it didn't matter what novel we read. It didn't matter if it was a short story, it didn't matter if it was a novel, it could have been poetry. But because we could tie it together with a big idea, the kids were able to make much better sense of it. So that's one way that you can create connections. Um, one of my favorite short stories is Salvador Later Early by Sandro Cisneros. And um, what I love most about it is 
that when it was presented to me in a uh, session at a conference, um, the speaker talked about being his students being able to connect to it. Now he taught um, high school and I wondered if it was possible for kids younger than that to be able to connect to this. And so the very first um, paragraph says, Salvador with eyes the color of a caterpillar, Salvador of the crooked hair and crooked teeth, Salvador whose name the teacher cannot remember is a boy who is no one's friend, runs along somewhere in that vague direction where homes are the color of bad weather, leaves behind a raw wood, leaves behind a raw wood doorway, shakes the sleepy brothers awake, ties their shoes, combs their hair with water, feeds them milk and cornflakes from a tin cup in the dim dark of the morning. Salvador later early, sooner or later, arrives with the string of younger brothers ready, helps his mama who's busy with the business of the baby, tugs the arms of Cecilio Arturito, makes them hurry because today, like yesterday, Arturito has dropped the cigar box of crayons, has let go of the hundred little fingers of red, green, yellow, blue, and nub of black sticks that tumble and spill over and beyond the asphalt puddles until the crossing guard lady holds back the blur of traffic for Salvador to collect them again. And so I read that piece to third and fourth grade students in my class. And I asked them, how can you, how do you connect with this? And some of them said, yeah, I have, I have several siblings. I've got a couple of brothers and sisters. Um, some of them said, I help my mom all the time. She's a single mom. Um, a couple of the kids noted the crooked teeth. You know, I, I have to get braces later. Um, they talked about having broken crayons or how hard it is to make friends. Um, later on in the, in the short story, it talks about the scars that he has and there's, and he wears wrinkled clothing. So there were pieces of it that they could identify with. I went again then to a level, um, a high school level course and talked to the kids and said, we're gonna read the same piece and I wanna see what connections you come up with. And rather than focusing on just the physical pieces and maybe a little bit of the emotional pieces, they were able to connect to the story because they saw an idea of poverty. What happens when you have a single parent? How difficult is it to be the eldest of several and take care of all of those, all of those little guys? Um, what's it like to not be seen by your peers? And we had some wonderful discussions about it, but even though this particular piece is only 788 words, the kids were able to connect to it in a way that got them closer to the character and by default closer to the author and they were interested in reading more um, that Cisneros wrote. So to move it kind of in a different direction. Um, we had a group of kids in the upper division, so seventh and eighth grade, and they were reading classics. And one of the classics that they read was Pride and Prejudice. And um, it's not a book that's easy for um, boys to really get into. One of the comments that was made was, oh, why is there so much dialogue? They talk all the time. Can you make it stop? They could be so much more efficient with their time and this would be a much shorter book if they just quit talking and say what they mean. So this is an example and I, it's actually pulled from the movie rather than the, the book, but it, you know, it, it gives you an idea of just how wordy um, that particular novel is. And the other question the kids had was, did they really talk like that during this time? Why was this such a big deal? Why couldn't they just, you know, if they liked each other, why couldn't they just get together and say, hey, I'd like to take you out? And so we talked about the historical connections. You know, in the early 19th century, or the, in the, I think this was written in 1918, um, during that period of time, what was society like? What was the pecking order? Why was it such, um, why was it so important that you marry well? Um, how were women treated? And why was 
you know, who had the power going back to that big idea? How did they get the power? Why did they want the power? And what benefit was it to, you know, the young lady looking for a suitable husband? Those connections were helpful for the kids because they were able to research a little bit further. Um, one of the projects that the kids did, they examined dialogue in the book. And because they were all about efficiency, because, you know, we're 12 and 13 year old boys, um, they decided to create a rap to just let's get right to the point. They took some of Mr. Darcy's um, Mr. Darcy's dialogue and created a short rap that was, you know, significantly shorter than what um, had been written in the book, but also it was in a way that they could understand it. So it was, you know, the words were simpler, the vocabulary wasn't as difficult for just, you know, a general, uh, just anybody to understand. And they were able to talk about the difference between the vocabulary that was used during that time and how people spoke with one another versus how we have so many different ways to speak to each other. That idea of code switching, um, the way that you know you as a child talk with your friends is very different, I hope, when you talk to your grandparents or when you talk with your teachers or later on how you speak with an employer. And so that, that use of language got to come up. And for the language geeks of which I, am a card carrying member, um, they, were, they were really able to dive deep into the use of particular words and why authors choose the words that they do. Um, going back to the Cisneros piece, there's a number of beautiful, beautiful images in her writing, um, both in the story of Salvador, Salvador, but also in all of her other stories, because she wants you to see and, and feel and kind of be there in the moment. Um, the other thing that I noticed when I was in the classroom and um, Doug Alexander alluded to this and talked in depth about it uh, a couple of weeks ago is that idea of integrating the things that kids love into what it is that you're doing. Um, that idea of personal interests and pop culture um, the years when I was teaching, and I think it's probably still the same, Pokemon is a thing. Um, and Minecraft, I learned more about Minecraft in three years um, just by reading kids' writing than I would ever have liked to have known. But some of the things that we talked about in class is how is X like Y? Um, how is Kaylee Fry? who is brilliant at so many things as the mechanic on um, the Serenity, how is, how is she like another character being as awkward as she is with others? Um, we talked about the idea of the space cowboy and you know, is he really a bad guy? You're thinking Han Solo, you're thinking Mel Reynolds. Is he really a bad guy? Or is he not? Who is he like in a particular story? Um, we talked about, you know, good versus evil and all of those themes and those big ideas that flow through everything that kids are doing and playing with and watching and listening to now that matter to them. Um, and they were able to then connect with literature and make connections with um, characters and places and settings. And they would, they would come back and say, gosh, I wish my health was at 122% because right now it's only at five. And that was a way for them to communicate with one another, you know, drawing on the idea of um, HP or, or um, Pokemon power. So um, this is the lifestyle and culture is probably a little bit more difficult. And I say this not to be I don't want to, I don't want it taken wrong, um, but this is probably one of the most difficult things for teachers to do because we don't often share the same lifestyle or culture as our students. A lot of us get into teaching because we want to help make a difference. We want to talk to our kids. We want to, to connect with them. Um, and for gifted students, a lot of what um, 
a lot of what they see in classrooms and in the literature that they read is superficial. And so it's so, so important that we look at the historical connections um, so the kids can kind of see how where this particular piece of literature fits into the bigger picture. Um, when you think about language and customs, going back to Pride and Prejudice, um, why, why did they speak the way they did? How was the language developed? Um, what were the customs of the time? You know, who were really important people during that time? What events had taken place to create this social structure and some of these social norms? Um, tying it to art, we have so many amazing gifted artists. Being able to tie that to something that they can feel in their hearts and see in their minds makes it much richer, a much richer experience for them. Um, thinking about film and other entertainment, comparing and contrasting a book with a movie. When the kids watched um, the Pride and Prejudice uh, miniseries, the one with Colin Firth, because that's the right one, um, they were fascinated at how different everything sounded than the way that they had heard all the dialogue in their head when they actually had somebody speaking the words. Um, when you connect music, whether it's with that time period or something current, can you find a song that says, you know, how this character is feeling? Thinking about poetry, spoken word poetry is without a doubt one of the biggest connectors, I think, because the feeling of the poet in the words that they're sharing with you are, it is, it's right there. You can't miss it. Um, whereas where you, when you read it, it's a little bit different because you're analyzing the words and when it's spoken word, you're feeling their feelings. Um, thinking too, from a culturally responsive um, sense, honoring kids' heritage and background. There's no reason why, in addition to reading books like Pride and Prejudice or um, some of the other typical novels that we read, why can't we read more of Sandra Cisneros? Why can't we read um, novels and literature that are written by people of color, perhaps those from other countries, to ensure that the culture and background of the kids that we're serving is being shared. Um, it's amazing to me that, because I didn't think about it when I was growing up, every child that I read about in my head was a white child because I'm white. And the first time I read about anybody who wasn't, it was like, huh, that's really different. And I learned about dialect and I learned about why people speak certain ways and depending upon where they live in the United States or in another country, why all of those things were the way they were. But I think that for us to become a little more culturally aware, it's important to integrate those things and connect with them as a class and as individuals as we're teaching our young ones. Um, I had the opportunity to listen to um, I'm going to butcher her name, I just know it, Chimamanda Adichie um, in a TED talk when I went to a conference and she was talking about the danger of a single story. And she said, a single story creates stereotypes and the problem with stereotypes is not that they're untrue, but that they're incomplete. They make one story become the only story. And I wanted to incorporate this because we talk a lot about um, equity and the importance of kids seeing themselves in the books that they read and um, the culture, cultural pieces that they study. And I think that this rings true when, especially from a literature perspective, simply because kids need to see and hear from those people who have additional stories to tell. As, you know, as a teacher, you read The Three Little Pigs, but then you contrast it with the true story of The Three Little Pigs, and the kids are able to see the same story, but from two totally different perspectives. Um, this is another piece. This is the other part of Salvador Later Early. Um, and what I've saw, I found fascinating about the kids' reaction to this piece 
um, was that idea of a mirror text and a window text. Some children read this um, talking about geography of scars, a history of hurt, um, and they saw themselves. They saw their background, they saw their families, they saw the experiences that they had had. And for others, it was a window text. It was a way for them to see how someone else might live, something that they might have experienced that the child reading the story hadn't. Um, what I found really interesting about this particular section is um, the part that says, um, collects, um, collects his brothers scuttling, scuttles off dodging the many schoolyard colors, the elbows and wrists crisscrossing uh, the several shoes running. When I asked the kids, what do you see there? Several of them said, well, clearly they live in the inner city and there's gang activity. Those are the colors. And other kids said, well, wow, I never really thought about that. In their mind, maybe it was a school uniform. In their mind, maybe it was just the color of all of, you know, the little little bitties playground has all of these big primary colors. That's what they were seeing. So it was really very interesting how children saw this particular piece um, and how they were able to connect to it. Um, the beauty of literature is that you allow readers to see things through other people's eyes. All good books do this. Um, this is a quote from Sandra Cisneros and I thought that it was applicable because really this is what we're trying to do with literature is we want kids to have different perspective and to see things that are not only meaningful to them, but also might be meaningful to the world around them. Um, so that's me really. Um, if you have questions, I would love to hear them. Um, this is how you can contact me. And I'm going to unshare my screen. All right. All right. And we were having the the slides were not quite coming up. And so um, but it was just amazing to listen to your stories. And so I did have um, if you could, what's the name of the first book you talked about with the crayons? Oh, so um, it's called Salvador Later Early, and it's in Woman Hollering Creek and Other Stories by Sandra Cisneros. And so that's where she has a number of wonderful stories in here. My other favorite is called Eleven. And it's all about um, someone who is turning 11 and what that feels like. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you so much. This was amazing. And I know when, as soon as you started to tell that story, I hopped on and I was Googling and Cisneros, there's a bunch of amazing things. So I'm looking over as we speak to see, I haven't seen any specific questions, but I was just intrigued, especially by the last part you just said about how, how these kids looked at those colors. Mm -hmm. I mean, how they saw some of them as, as the color, you know, gang colors and in inner city mm -hmm. and others saw them really just from, it's their experiences that mm -hmm. shape that. And mm -hmm. I think that connections and connecting with literature, I love, um, I love all of the resources you shared. So I wanted to let everyone know that's watching us. We'll make sure that we also have the, um, the slides available yep. on the website as well. And um, let's see, do we have any other questions? Um, I was curious about uh, that code switching. I love, I mean, I've talked about that a lot and I've done some research and that is such an important thing. And how, how far, how deep did you go with your students to explain, talk about it? Or did you just kind of have it in as part of the conversation? Um, a little bit of both. So with my third and fourth graders, it was it was a much more surface level conversation than it was with the older kids. Um, because the little guys, you know, they speak to their family a certain way, they speak to their friends a certain way, but generally it's not a whole lot different. Um, you've got 
kids who have learned because their parents are military. You know, Colorado Springs is a military town. You call people, sir, you call people, ma'am, you take your hat off when you walk in. Um, but there's, there's language that you would use with people who work with your parent that you wouldn't use with your teacher at school because it's a little more casual at school than it would be when you're with, you know, people that your parent works with. Um, for the older students, we find that it, it can be a deeper conversation because the way that you speak, they're getting to that age where the way that you speak with a teacher or a counselor or a potential employer is going to matter. You know, you don't walk in wearing, you know, ripped up jeans and the whole thing, but you're, you're, the way you speak to somebody really tells who you are. So, you know, we talk about how it doesn't matter whether or not teachers wear jeans to work because we're still professional in the way that we, the way that we present ourselves to our kids. And it's, it's that idea of language and body language saying a lot more than what we're wearing necessarily. Oh, I think that's so important for our kids to understand. And it just, it, makes so much sense. So I just love all of the, I'm going to have to go get all of the books you were talking about now though, to work with this. Um, oh, and Hector just popped on and said, we use the little prints. Oh yes. Yes. Um, to our children of different ages. Mm -hmm. um, Hector's joining us from um, Puerto Rico, if I have that correct. Oh, wow. And Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to be tech savvy there. Um, and then it said, um, Let's see. Amazing how the mind changes during their growth. Um, what do you um, what do you know about this book? I think he might be asking. Oh, about the Little Prince. The little Prince. Um, so I've never I haven't actually taught it, but I know that um, our level seven language arts class used it this year as um, a springboard into some more classic literature that idea of power, that idea of um, um, relationship between individuals and, you know, the world around them. So it's, I've heard, I feel terrible that I haven't actually read it. <laughs> and if I did, it was a very, very long time ago. Um, but I know that we've used it for a number of examples, even with the little guys. So I, that's where I've seen it, you know, the whole spectrum. Mm -hmm. And then Jenny Mitchell asks, how do you build a level of literature with our twice exceptional students? That's a great oh. question, Jenny. Thank you. I okay. So depending upon the extra exceptional, um, you've got gifted and something else. And so there are several novels out there um, that are able to allow kids to see themselves in the story. So one of them is, I think, Fish in a Tree is, an, is one. Um, oh gosh, Out of My Mind was another. Um, and when I read it, I read it, one, I read um, out, of, out of My Mind as a, uh, as a read aloud. And the kids didn't quite understand that the main character, everything she was thinking was, it was just in her head. She couldn't actually verbalize any of it. And um, when they figured it out, they were like, oh, so people who aren't verbal still have stuff going on. They do. Um, and, you know, and some of us are a little more verbose than others, but still that complexity of thought was there. And it was interesting for the kids to connect with that a little bit differently. Love it. Those are great examples. Wonderful. Okay. Well, I am going to say this has been a fantastic learning experience for me. And um, if you have any questions for Teresa, you can um, contact her through, um, through CAGT as well. And we will be posting the slides and we'll get everything on. And if you have additional questions, please just push them out to us and we'll make sure that Teresa can get them. And I really appreciate your time and you sharing with us tonight. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening, guys. Bye, everyone on Facebook. Thank you so much.